So now we'll talk about carbon projects, because I think that's what we want to know about it. Eh? That was just the background. So I think the most important idea about a carbon project or carbon offset when we get paid for carbon is this one. Is either avoiding the release of carbon. So we, was, we had the patch of forest that was going to be locked and turn into a ranch for cows, for example. So from a lot of carbon, we go to very little. Mm -hmm. So we can get paid to safe protect this forest and not lose this carbon that was going to be cut, burned and everything in the atmosphere. Or we can also sequester carbon. So we had the grassland or maybe a degraded farm or something. And now we plant trees and we get money for storing more carbon there. And the take home message for you guys that I want you to take home today is that any carbon project needs to be additional, which means that without this intervention that we call carbon project, it would not have happened. So if we safe protect a forest in an island in the middle of the Pacific, but there's nobody living there and nobody was going to cut it and it was going to be there anyway, regardless of our project, then this is not a carbon project. We cannot get paid for it because we didn't do anything special, okay? So additional, it must be an addition to what was going to happen in this piece of land. So there's two types of markets for carbon credits, what we call the regulatory, the compulsory, and um, this comes, this is, this is where red would fall in, and then the voluntary. So um, the regulatory is with this idea that every country that ha would have a cap how much they can emit, how much they can pollute, and if they want to pollute more, they can buy the how much another country was going to emit. So for example, I'm from Spain, and we have a big oil company, and we are going to emit a lot because we are selling our oil, and we also produce and contaminate a lot when we produce our oil. But now I have my friend Franklin that is in Congo. He has little opportunities of income, and he comes and tells me, hey Aida, you know, instead of helping you you know, so you can produce and pollute the same. Me, I'm allowed to pollute, I don't know, eh, 10 tons. You can buy the 10 tons for me. Eh? I'll save my forest, it will keep 10 tons, and you can continue to pollute. So this is an idea. Of course, this is not happening. Why? Because all the countries in the world need to agree, eh? and you know, this is hard. So people are still discussing about it. <laughs> but we, I'm going to start talking a little bit about the voluntary market. So this is outside what is going to be compulsory. This is just people voluntarily want to either sell the carbon credits or buy. Of course, it's on a smaller scale, and to be able to do this in the voluntary market, you still need to be certified. Eh? It's not that Franklin can come to me and say, hey, I'll sell you 500,000 tons of carbon. And I'm like, okay, cool, prove it to me. You know, Show me the papers, who came to verify this, who consultant did you pay to get this? Eh? It's a bit like if we want to sell our coffee fat trade, we need to pay for somebody to come and check what is our procedure fair trade. So it's a bit of the same idea. So the real question is, why would somebody want to buy these carbon credits if it's not compulsory? Any ideas? Why a company in Spain would spend money on this? No ideas. Oh, there's two reasons. So let's see if we can find at least one. Yeah? Good faith. It looks good, exactly. You know me, I'm a company. I recently had a problem with my boat carrying a lot of oil off the coast of Ghana. Very bad, eh? I'm all over the news. Oh, Shell is polluting the fisheries of Ghana, shit. Now, but now I go to the government of Ghana and see, ah, is there any carbon project? Oh, no, 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 me, I'm saving. Also, I'm also investing in saving the rainforest of Ghana. So although I just ruined the fisheries, it's okay. At least I can save the rainforest of Ghana. Good. So just to clean the image of certain companies, certain type of companies, very good. There's another reason. Anyone has an idea? What is the other reason? Why would a company invest in buying the carbon in the voluntary now? Yeah? Maybe there are some uh companies, mainly in the uh, USA, which there is a, a legislation which they, we say that you pollute, you, you must pay, pay for it. Mm -hmm. 
I listen that is mainly in the USA. Mm -hmm. So there are some uh, many companies mm -hmm. they pollute more but and they, they need mm -hmm. they to pay a little to, bit to mm -hmm. pay something. So in some places this is it because of local or regional legislation, not the global one that was mentioned before also. But I think the idea it comes back to this one. If it ever becomes compulsory for everybody, the price of a carbon credit will be high. Because there's not so much forest out there in the world, is it? So the idea is that some companies are investing. We can buy these carbon credits now, voluntary, it looks good on us. And if this becomes compulsory in 10, even in 20 years, we buy them now that they are cheap, we'll be saving a lot of money. So that's another motivation, that as the price of the carbon credit now is quite low, some people buy it, some companies buy it, because it looks good. And actually, it's not just that it looks good on them, they actually hoping to be saving money in the future. So let's talk a little bit about the carbon project. So as I said, to have a carbon project, we have a piece of land. We plant some trees. Very important, it needs to be in a clearly defined area. Eh? It cannot be in a random place. Eh? You need to have the paperwork, clear where you did your intervention. So that's what the boundary that we call. So if nothing would have happened, we would have very low carbon, maybe five ton per hectare. Now we decided to restore this whatever land and now we increase the carbon. So to be able to be a carbon project, you need to be able to quantify what was the difference. What did you do to make this place different? And that's why there's less CO2 in the atmosphere. At the same time, it's the same thing. Maybe you can have a forest, maybe in Congo, where it was going to be cut. And now you say, no, no, this was clearly going to be cut. There was a logging company coming here and getting all the carbon out and you know this would have very little now i'm going to protect it so you need to prove that you did something different your project did something special and now we'll have more carbon because we didn't lose this and we get money for it so the idea is that having a carbon project eh, even in the voluntary market is not easy and it's not cheap I think this is an important thing because people always approach me. Oh, I have a forest in my community. Can I turn it into a carbon project? Okay, question. How big is your forest? How many people live near it? What is the threat? Because if it's not threat, then you're not going to, to sell your carbon. Eh? You cannot justify. So this is just a little bit of the steps. So we have the project, pre-project evaluation. This would be a bit of a a survey of if it's possible or worth it. Then we design our project, the structure. We need to do the monitoring. Okay, what is out there? What do we quantify? Frank Lenz says it's 500 tons of carbon. Okay, we need to pay a consultant to come and check that this is true. Somebody from outside the country, from outside your system, a third party. And then if it's all it's good, okay, now you can start selling your credits. But remember that for a carbon credit, eh? sorry, for a carbon project, they usually go between 30 and 50 years, let's say 30 years. You get paid, it's a bit like an insurance company. Imagine that in the whole of your project you will receive $10,000, eh? just to make it simple, over 30 years. Okay, $30,000 over, over 30 years. So it's not that every year you get $1,000, eh? this would be the logic. 30 years, $30,000, you don't get paid all in the beginning, you don't get paid the same every year. It's a bit like an insurance mechanism. People that are buying your carbon are afraid that you will go and cut the forest something will happen. So the first year, instead of a thousand, you get 100 euros. Second year, oh, the guy is nice, eh? good, 120. The third year, oh, he's still nice, eh? the forest is still there, 200. And then year five arrives, and he says, okay, go and check that it's still there. Now you do the, your first monitoring. Eh? You, you pay again a consultant, hey, that's the thing, eh? it becomes expensive. That's why I say it's not cheap. You get a consultant to come to check that you still have the carbon you promised to have. Okay, good. Now, for the year six, you can start getting paid maybe $500. Year 10, you get com checked again. Oh, the guy is still doing well. Eh? Now we'll pay him 600. So the idea is that in a carbon project, you get most of the money at the end because people are afraid something may go wrong. But it's still a good investment. As we said, if we live in a poor area where there's few alternative, even if you just get $100 the first year, it's still good, eh? It just it needs to be clear on the expectations on people. Yeah, we'll get paid 30000 if nothing 
happens, eh? You know, if we live near a volcano now, a volcano explodes and our forest is ruined, sorry guys, you will not get paid. So that's why I think it's a great idea, but there's some challenges. So to get certified, to come, body needs to come and check that what you say you have, you actually have in terms of carbon, there's different mechanisms. And I'm going to be talking a little bit of, about the first two. They're both based in US and I put the website so you can play with it. The verified carbon standards is mostly just on the quantification. How much carbon do you have? And the second one would be a bit like the fair trade label. If you actually help the climate, of course, if we deal with carbon and climate change, we already know we help the climate. Eh? But also the local communities, maybe you have indigenous people and you take them into account that they can continue to fish and hunt in the forest. So you don't disturb them, you get certified. Or maybe if you have a few endangered animals there, you can get also certified. So the idea is that if you were going to sell your carbon credit by $10, if you manage to with the BCS, if you also certify CCB, maybe you can sell it for 15. So of course it's an investment eh? to get certified with the second one, but you also get more money. So it's like more stink, eh? it's like agriculture commodities. So it's a bit of the same thing. So I think the first part of the project, of course, is the feasibility study. Is this feasible, a carbon project? First question, I always ask people, okay, how big is your forest or how big is your land? If it's 2,000 hectares, hey, forget it, eh? You never recover the investment of the consultants and everything. Which vegetation do you have? As I said, rainforest, a lot of carbon. Maybe you have a savanna, depends how many trees you have. Also depends how big is your savanna. So it depends on the vegetation type. Standard for, uh, forest. Um, how big is this supposed to be? Qualified yeah. It forest? depends on your area as well. Oh. So that's why I said there's things that you need to think. I cannot tell you because I can tell you that running a project in Congo is more expensive than in Kenya. So you also need to think that into account because of governance issues. So there's no recipe eh, that if you have at least 5,000 hectares of forest that it has at least 200 tons per hectare, your project will be worth it. It's not like that because it depends on the context. How many villages needs to get paid? You know, what is the threat? Is this agriculture or mining? Is this a private land or public land? I mean, even if it's public land, do you need to get the permit, I mean you need to get everybody that it's land owner with the boundary of your project to sign. If you have 10 communities, it's not a lot of paperwork. If you have 150, it's a lot of money to invest. So that's the things you need to think when you think about may it be feasible in my area or the area I work or something like this. Yes, sorry? Can we be able to know the consultancy costs so that we can be able to add that to our planning? It all depends on the size of your project as well. <laughs> if it's a small, don't bother. Uh, that's the thing. Consultants are expensive. If consultant rate is known. You're able to know what acreage. Mm. But that's why you need to do a. I mean, the feasibility study eh, is not even to the consultant. <laughs> this is making your calculations before you even think if calling the consultant is worth it. <laughs> so, so it's just some of the ideas. So, very important. What is the threat? Because if your forest is not a threat. You will never have a carbon project. What are the deforestation rates? If they're very low, it means you do have a threat maybe, but the deforestation is very low. Also hard to sell eh, your project. So yeah, if you can get the documents, as I said, and also the communities is very important. If we set up a carbon project, all the work we have to do, all the investment, and we forgot to get our neighbors with us, they might just get jealous and come and burn our thing and our project is ruined. So also very important to involve the communities, not just the local, but our neighbors. It depends on the type of land ownership that we're dealing with. And feasibility is very important because how much does it cost to prepare everything and how much are we going to make? And this is very important because the price of the carbon credit has changed over time. It's like any other commodity. Remember, this is not a fixed thing. It keeps changing. So in 2008, it was nearly 30 euros uh, the ton of carbon. Eh? This is the European market. Not long ago, it was less than five. So it keeps changing. So also that will have a lot of effect in our project design. We need to plan for a small price of carbon. If with the carbon credit at five euros per ton, we can still make money, then okay, this is worth preparing. But if we can only 
we will only make money if the price is at 20 maybe it's not worth everything because there's a risk price change over time and just as a quick question what happened in 2008 that made the carbon price drop like crazy in Europe at least no idea economic crisis in Europe so companies didn't have the money to spare to buy carbon credits to look good because at the end of the day it's voluntary so there was too many projects out there nobody to buy them price decline so remember that when you think about a carbon project it's not the set price but that's why some companies want to buy it now when it's low because they think oh if this ever becomes compulsory the price will continue to grow up and we buy a lot of them very cheap now we'll, you know for 30 years we'll be saving a lot of money so let's talk a little bit about how we design a project so the first step is to find what is the threat in our area then how many years are we going to run the project maybe if it's deforestation we have a lot of carbon a small period of time 30 years is good enough if we are planting trees maybe we need more years eh? because trees don't grow very fast so we need to have a longer project time we need to show that we are doing something special to save the project or to put uh, sorry to save carbon or to put carbon in this area we need to have a monitoring plan we need to estimate how much we have before out there before we start the project and how much we are going to reduce and two concepts very important baseline and leakage and I want these two words if you need to remember two words about carbon eh, it's probably these two baseline this is what would happen if there was no carbon project would the land be turned into farming because of course it's different eh? if we cut the forest and we turn it into a ranch of grass from let's say a lot of carbon you go to something like zero but if you cut your forest and you turn it into like slash and burn agriculture small scale people don't clear all the forest eh? small farmers they leave some trees if a tree is good for medicine they keep it if it's good for fruits I keep it so it's not that you become zero here eh? you still have some trees so it's important to understand what would happen if there was no project and the second one is leakage so even if we put a carbon project and you pay the communities to save the project eh? these guys still need to eat they still need to fetch firewood to prepare their food they might still choose to farm somewhere else so it's very important in the project to account for leakage so we protect an area but people still need to find a way to make a living outside so it's kind of you shift some of the deforestation that was got or forest degradation that was going to happen in your land to your neighbor's land so you cannot sell the carbon credits of those eh? because this would happen anyway the CO2 will go to the atmosphere anyway even if you have a project so it's very important to estimate this as well 